I um, am really looking forward to getting back into the eschatology series. Um, but um, 161 malls looted and a whole bunch of other things have happened this week. Have, it means that I need to speak into that more specifically today and not go back into the series. I was hoping to touch on some of the things regarding that today as well, but I don't think there'll be time for that. So I'm not going to do that. So we've done week one and week two, and we will move into week three very soon. Hopefully next week. Is this mic on, by the way? Is it okay? Um, so we're going to just talk a little bit about, about um, just what God has called us to do this week and um, as a result of the things we've seen. And we're going to end just by praying a little bit. Uh, uh, we've got there, there, there are four people who will pray afterwards just to end off this, this uh, time together today. And again, I want to say if you're joining us online, welcome. It's great to see you. I hope you're making a lot of noise at home. I hope you're shouting and cheering and saying amen and putting in comments and sending hearts and likes and all sorts of things. Just let us know that you're there, that you're alive and active, and um, that you're out of bed. Um, so I don't need to, I don't need to, we've, we've had enough um, of ENCA and News24 and all sorts of other things and social media telling us what's happened this week. Um, but just to sum it up, there's been chaos, there's been destruction, there's been looting, there's been anarchy, um, and uh, there is no doubt that it's been a coordinated effort. Somewhere behind the scenes, someone, some group of people, some network has coordinated something to, to, to bring um, chaos and destabilization to our nation. But I believe that um, when the enemy shows his hand that clearly, it's because he's playing his last card. And it's, it's a new day in South Africa. It's a new day in South Africa. And something that just blew me away, I just, I just thought about how quickly things changed. So Monday and Tuesday, we saw what was going on. By Wednesday and Thursday, there was cleanup happening across KZN. People coming together of different race groups, different languages, different cultures, coming together to clean up. Some of you might have seen that video of um, the, the staff and checkers just worshiping Jesus just singing and worshiping him um, outside before they went in to work for the day. You would have seen another video of um, a group of people cleaning up one of the spas. And uh, as they were cleaning up the spa, they were singing Kosi Sikalele Africa. And isn't it amazing just what a beautiful national anthem we have. I was just so struck by that again. We sang it on Tuesday night. We, 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 just, we knew we needed to worship and pray together. I hope that you were able to pull in at least online or be a part of that on Tuesday night. Um, but we, we sang Kosi Sikalele Africa. Um, and I said to Endor, I said, I know my accent's not amazing. He said, Dora, you're doing fine. So, <laughs> uh, and then Nikki was like, hey, the Afrikaans, David, you, got, you need some help with that. Then the last four lines, I could really, I could sing that very clearly, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, people have come together. There's a newfound sense of unity. And there's been the cleaning up and the community coming together, and we, we are just, we just sound amazed by just the incredible community response to protect our community, to protect our coast, to protect the different areas around KZN, um, the way people have come together to, to, to clean up. Um, a group of people got together to pray. There was just this prayer meeting happening outside before they went off to, to do whatever it was that they were doing. I heard of one group of people um, that got together to pray outside one of the hospitals this week as well. And uh, well, they were worshiping, something, something like that. But they got together to just, just lift up the name of Jesus outside the hospital. And um, we, I'm trusting God for the different things that we can do. We need, to, we need to do what God has called us to do. And I know amongst us, even in our church, there have been people involved in roadblocks and, and um, driving around and just being part of the community watches. Others have been dropping off food. Others have been um, praying and worshiping. And we've all been doing our, our part and uh, the, the important thing is not to try and do what someone else is doing, but do what God has told you to do. Um, because we can't all stand at a roadblock, but um, we also can't all um, go and give food, you know. So we all, need to, we all need to do what God has called us to do. And that's really important in this time. I also want to say, let's keep our eyes on the good that's happening because there is also a lot of bad. In the light of all, everything that I've just said, there's also the, the negative side of all those things. I'm going to touch on some of those things as I carry on in my message a little bit today. It's one thing to say the community is coming together, but is the community coming together in a way that honors all people? Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot to think about with these things, and a lot of issues have been raised, and a lot of, a lot of 
hurts and things of the past in South Africa had risen to the surface again. I, I haven't heard so much correlation to pre-94 and apartheid um, as much as I've heard this week. And uh, I, I, I think it's a good thing if the church rises. If the, church doesn't, if, if the church doesn't make a difference in this time, it can, it can become a bad thing. Uh, because when these things get stirred up and brought to the surface again, it's an opportunity to dialogue. It's an opportunity to talk. It's an opportunity to pray. It's an opportunity to be really healed up. It's an opportunity to forgive. Um, and so, so in, in, in what we're facing, in what we're, we're seeing, we, 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 we know God wants to raise up a standard. And... Uh, and with the enemy playing his card, and we know there are evil people out there because they are in the grips of the enemy. And as they do what they do, it's time for the church to arise and not fight with the weapons, the physical weapons that people fight with, but fight with the weapons that God has given us because he, his weapons are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. And I was chatting to Shirley this week. She was just saying how in real time she would, she would get something through on WhatsApp and then she, 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 would, she was praying with Monica and others. And as they, they would pray things through through the night, um, they would see things breaking as they would pray. Like the, the, there would be a problem here and that thing would, would be sorted out as they were praying these things through. And, and so they were seeing in, very, in real time God answering prayer. And, and it's not a time for us to step back and to become lackadaisical or okay, it's all okay. Now this is a time for us to to really step forward. And, and even as peace comes again into our nation, which it will, and even as things calm down and rebuilding starts to happen, which it is already and will continue to, even as all that starts to happen, I really believe that as a church, we've got to not let our God down. That this has been a wake-up call. Um, I, I really feel it's been a wake-up call to the church. Once again, you put the church into the, into the corner and push them out of rele- uh, into a place of irrelevance, and you end up seeing chaos, anarchy, and destruction. Um, and one of the things that, that people have left out of the equation in all the discussions, so you've been watching some of the discussions on, on the news, on ENCA, some of them have been really good. Um, there's been some great, if you've had time to watch, you know, there's been some good discussions out there, and um, there's been some great articles that have been written, just kind of putting the South African context into the context of history and what's happened in other places in the world, and just some clever thinkers, some great minds, and uh, some wonderful communicators who've, who, who've been communicating and talking through these things and helping South Africa to process. I want to say there's one thing that's been completely left out in this entire equation. Through all the philosophy, through all the politics, through all the community, let's come together and do our thing. I'm talking about online, and uh, especially with, with what we see in the news, what we see in the mainstream category. The one thing that we see left out completely is this thing called the church. The church, and yet the church is the single biggest, most important factor to the future of any nation. And uh, so, so people will say, "Oh, you know, it's amazing how the community came together." The reason why that's happening, the reason why people are cleaning up, is because there is a church in South Africa that is strong, that is vibrant, and is getting stirred up again. The sleeping giant is getting stirred up again. Amen. Um, Yeah. So. Maybe I should get into my message. <laughs> um, today is a national day of prayer. It's been declared as a national day of prayer by the government. And I want to say this. We do not need the government to declare a national day of prayer. Um, uh, when they do, though, let's think of it as like Elisha and the, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Because when it's a national day of prayer, it's not a national day of Christian prayer. It's a national day of prayer for the Muslims to pray and the Hindus to pray and everybody to pray. Um, And there's lots of different people who do pray in different, different contexts. Um, but think of it as Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You know, it, it, just, just because the government's called us to pray doesn't mean, oh, the government called us to pray, whatever. No, let's pray. Because we're, we're, we're making a stand. And uh, others can pray and they can, they can try and call down fire. Um, but we're praying to the true God. We're praying to the God who does answer with fire. Amen. Um, so we're going to pray like Elijah. We know in James chapter 5 or James chapter 6, it speaks about um, praying like Elijah. is just an ordinary person like you and I. But when he prayed, things happened. And he's just an ordinary person. I love the way the Bible paints that picture. I mean, we, we see how he gets depressed, goes off and says, woe is me, I want to die. You know, just after this great victory. And sometimes as, as Christians, we can feel the same way. We can experience incredible victories. And then two days later, we're like, 
I just want to go be with Jesus. I just, I just, I'm just done. I'm done. I'm done, you know. And uh, God's like, here's some food. You're going to walk for the next 40 days because I want to meet with you. And I go, oh, thanks, God. That's very unencouraging. Um, but Elijah was a guy just like us with emotions just like us. And, but when he prayed with faith, things happened. So God is calling us to pray. Today is also Nelson Mandela Day, which I, I was just struck by through the week, just thinking of the, the, the opposite of what that day means and what we saw happening this week, the exact opposite. And I mean, Nelson Mandela Day, we know it speaks about action against poverty, about in, inspiring change, taking action. Um, basically, leaders to rise up who are like this great man, Nelson Mandela. And I want to say this. Um, we, again, also don't need a Nelson Mandela Day because as great and as amazing as he was, he, is, he pales into significance compared to who Jesus is. And, uh, and so we want to see people who take action and are inspired and, and fight poverty and preach the gospel because of Jesus. Amen? So I want to just touch a, a little bit on just some, some ways that we can respond today. Um, and maybe I'll do that first. And then I was going to read Nehemiah first. But I'll read Nehemiah at the end. I want to just talk about um, just some, just, 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 10 responses for us as we, as we think about uh, what has happened this week and how do we as a church respond, how do we as people respond. So let me go through these, these 10 thoughts. This is not an exhaustive list, obviously. They're just, just encouragement, encouraging thoughts. And then I want to um, read Nehemiah chapter 4, and we'll end with that, and then we'll have some people pray. Um, so firstly, I want to say this. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel unsure and uncertain, confused, um, afraid, sad, um, despair, whatever it is, it's okay to feel the way you're feeling. Um, David had no problem expressing his emotions in the Psalms. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling. We need to be able to process. If we go like, I shouldn't be feeling like this, then we don't deal with it. We don't process it. We need to process it. If I'm angry, I I need to express the fact that I'm angry. Not necessarily saying that, expressing that means kick the dog, smash the window. That's not, <laughs> um, that's not the point. But, but being able to, to allow our emotion, emotions are not good or bad. It's what we do with our emotions that is important. And so we need to process our emotions because otherwise we, the, these emotions can be so pent up and pushed down and suppressed. And then they come up in another moment of crisis and then it's, then it's worse than it, than it should have been. Because suddenly there's extra emotion coming up with all this other emotion, and that results in us making decisions that, that we, if, we had, if we were in our right state of mind, we would never have made those decisions. So we need to deal with emotions as they, as they come up, as they, as they arise, so that we're working through these things. And, and with, with good friends, good people around us, um, I, I, I do want to say this, I don't think it's wise to, to express our emotion on Facebook or Instagram or in WhatsApp statuses. I don't think those are wise places to do that. I think what is wise is to find a, a friend, a husband or a wife or a close friend and say, this is how I'm feeling. I just need a process. Somebody where, that, where you can sit with this person and you can actually just pour out your heart and that person goes, it's okay. And they're not going to Bible bash you back. That's important. That's important. Um, and uh, I mean, even through this week, just with some messages I've had with different friends, just seeing their emotion being expressed, but knowing that it's expressed in a safe space. Um, they've got my back. I've got their back. It's okay. Um, and uh, and you okay, it's okay to feel like that. So that's the first one. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling. Number two, we need to ask God for compassion. We need to ask God for compassion. Jesus didn't have sympathy. He had compassion. I mean, I've heard people say sympathy and compassion. Yeah, sympathy is like, oh, I feel, so, I feel so sorry for you and all of that. You know, whereas compassion is like identifying and seeing what's happening and then stepping in with a solution. Whether it is as clear-cut as that, I'm not so sure. But Jesus had compassion on the crowds. He had compassion on people. He didn't, um, he didn't kind of, uh, you know, wallow in their despair with them, but he gave them a solution. He gave them an answer. He brought them out. His compassion brought people out of that place. He had compassion on the crowds. He fed them. He had compassion on somebody. He healed them. There was a compassion that drove the way in which he lived. And uh, we need to, as a church of God, ask God for compassion. We need to start to see with the eyes of Jesus, see people with the eyes of Jesus. Um, That compassion will rise up inside of us. Compassion is a supernatural thing. It's not a natural thing. It's a supernatural thing. Sympathy comes very, very naturally. Um, But compassion is 
is, uh, is, really, is really looking to see what is the solution that heaven offers to this situation. What, is, what does God want to bring to this person's life? What can I do in this person's life right now to bring, a, to bring something of heaven into their lives? That's what compassion looks like. Just to remind us with that, we are all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. Some people's boats are, are, are sinking a lot more than other people's boats. Some people's boats have lots of holes in them. Um, some, people's, some people's boats, in, for them, they, they've lost their entire livelihood. They've lost 30, 40 years of what they've built up. Um, the, the Lunga, who works here on, on the grounds, told me um, yesterday, he said there were, there's a man in his area who has his little spaza shop has been completely destroyed. The man was crying because of what he has lost. You know, his boat looks different to other people's boats. We all face different boats, and so we need to, we need to ask God for compassion to be able to understand that. Um, yeah. Next, thirdly, forgiveness. If there was one thing Jesus told us to do, he said forgive. He said forgive people. He said forgive others. It, Nelson Mandela said that one of the most, the most powerful political tool is forgiveness. And he understood that in the realm of politics, how much more the church of Jesus Christ, how much more the church of Jesus Christ, where, where if we say we believe in Jesus and we live by the name of Jesus Christ, we should be walking in absolute and complete forgiveness in every way, in every detail of our lives. No matter how hard it is, we've talked about forgiveness often, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult, no matter what it is, no matter what injustice has come our way, no matter what injustice we may be feeling in our different spheres and different spaces as a result of what we've seen this week, we have to walk in forgiveness. Have we prayed that prayer this week? Father, forgive them. Every single one of those people who brought anarchy and destruction into KZN this week, into Gauteng, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. You know, when Stephen stood, he preached the gospel, and he stood there, and they, they, the, the, the leaders tore their clothes, dragged him out of the city, took him out into the dust outside Jerusalem, and stoned him to death. And he said, Father, into your, he, uh, into your hands, I, I, I think he said something similar to you, I, I, I commend my spirit to you. Then he stood up and, says, and said, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. Can you imagine what it took him to stand in that last moment? As he was dying, as his body was, as the, his life body, the life of his body was ebbing away, and he stood up and said, "Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do." You can only ask God to forgive when you when you've already forgiven, when you're walking in a place of forgiveness. Um, we can't understate how important forgiveness is going to be in the weeks and months ahead. We can't understate it because besides the big macro, what we're seeing, I could have said game or value. But besides the big picture of what we're seeing, there's going to be the individual stories. Um, I, I, the, the story of the young lady who had her car smashed and got beaten up by a community this week. Just, she was just driving to work. Lost everything because, because, she, she, because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. We can't understate how important forgiveness is going to be. The power of forgiveness. Forgiveness has to flow in our nation again. For too long, too many things have been pushed under the surface that have now been brought right up into the light. And let's allow the light to work with these things and sort these things out. And let's not allow them to go back into the darkness where they can just fester until another day or another, another time. Let's deal with these things now so our children don't have to fight the battles. We don't want our children to fight these same battles. They've got to have their own battles to fight in 10, 20, 30 years' time. If you want some picture of what South Africa could look like in 20, 30, 40 years' time, look at places like America. Look at places like England. Look at Europe. Look at some of these other countries. It'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of this, the, the, the other things that we're going to have to face and deal with. So we need to deal with what we're facing now so that, we, so that they've got the tools and the capacity and the power to fight what's going to come their way. Because when, when, when blessing and prosperity and a built-up nation, when that becomes the reality of who we are as South Africa, when people have stepped out of poverty, when there's less people in poverty than, than people who are in poverty, and we move more into that kind of middle-class way of living, kind of like a European way of living, like what's happened in Europe, there are going to be many, many other challenges. So we need to fight these battles now so these battles are won now so that the battles that are to come for the generations that come after us, that they will, that they will have the, the, the strength and the tools to do that. Amen? 
Forgiveness. Number four, do not allow racism of any form. Do not allow racism in any form. I believe that God has raised South Africa up to be an example to the world of what it can look like when different nations live together as one nation. Different nations living together as one nation. That we're one nation. That we can say, I am a South African. And we can all, as, as one, say, I'm a South African. And, and in South Africa, there is no place for racism. And it should be the church, the church that is, that is, that is, that is saying that, not the politicians. The politicians just use it for their own ends. They use races, they use the, we, we want to get rid of racism, and then they stir up racism, all depending on what they need in that season, all depending on what kind of political end they're trying to get to. But you and I as a church, regardless of what is happening in politics, regardless of what is happening um, out there, we need to say no to racism in every form and in everything we do in our minds, in our heart attitudes, and in the words we speak and in our actions, we need to live in a non-racist way. Amen? I think there have been, there definitely are people who believe in the name of Jesus in, who have had racism stirred up inside of them this week. It has to be resisted in every form. I want to say this, even in our local community down here, if my, if my black brothers and sisters are being stopped at roadblocks because of the color of their skin, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And we, we have got to, we've got to not allow that. As white people, we've got to not allow that. As black people, we've got to not allow that. As colored people, as Indian people, we've got to not allow that. We've got to recognize that we are different. But we can't be profiled based on the color of our skin. It broke my heart this week just to hear of just friends, just people right here who live right here in this community saying that they, they, they are being stopped at roadblocks because of the color of their skin. And then a friend who used to be part of our church and now lives in Durban North, she was telling me she's too scared to go to the shopping mall. And she's been trying to, trying to you know, figure out what to do because she can't get to the mall be, just because she's, she's the color of her skin. We've got to resist racism. It's one thing to protect our community, and yes, we need to protect our community, absolutely. But if protecting our community looks like racism, then we should, then we should open everything up and say, okay, cool, just let, allow whatever needs to happen to happen. But it's not worth, it's not worth protecting our community for racism to ra- raise its ugly head in our area. Amen? Okay, this is a light and easy message. Number five. Number five, help someone. Help someone. Who's your neighbor? Your neighbor's different to my neighbor. I'm not talking about the person necessarily who lives next door to you, but it might be the person who lives next door to you. It might be the person that you walk past in the street. It might be the person that stays somewhere else that you just need to reach out to and touch. But help someone. Who's, who is your neighbor? Ask God, who, who is my neighbor today? And just help. Every one of us gets to do something. I know every single one of us has been doing, have been doing things. Uh, but we all get to do something. Let's, let's help. If we all do our part, um, that, is what makes, that is what makes the church, who, that, 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 is, that is what makes the church what the, who the church is. Amen? I was going to say that is what makes our nation so incredible. And it is true. But our nation is incredible because of the church. Not for any other reason, because of the church. It's because of the church that 1994 happened. It's because of the church that we had a democratic birth, rebirthing of our nation. And it's because of the church that we're going to come through this situation. And when it's all said and done, the, politics will, the politicians will celebrate their politics and the philosophers will celebrate their philosophies. But behind the scenes, in the middle of it all, we'll know it was because the church stood up. And then the next five, I'll go through a little bit faster. Number six, worship. Just worship Jesus. Just worship. Look for every opportunity to sing, to worship, to love on him. Pick up a guitar, put some music on. Just worship him. Yes, every second of the day, every bit of our lives is worship. Our, life is, our lives are, we worship Him. We worship through everything that we do. But I'm also saying, sing songs. Sing praise songs. Praise Him. Lift up His name. Um, it's, it, it, it's, 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 it's a wonderful way to, to push out the negativity and the confusion and all the other stuff that wants to cloud and fill our minds. And as His name is lifted up, as His name is declared, He is drawing all men to Himself. Number seven, pray. Keep praying. 
don't stop praying. If God has stirred up inside of you this week a urgency to pray again and you've been praying more than you normally do, let that be the ongoing level of prayer going forward. Let that be how you pray next week and the week after and the week after. Um, I think it was Ben who keeps reminding us that no revival has ever come that was not preceded by prayer. And it, 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 we, need to, we need to be praying and then we need to pray some more and then we need to pray some more. Amen. And then pray some more. Pray without ceasing, Paul says. Number eight, remain thankful. Just keep walking in a place of thankfulness. I, I, over and over and over again, I've just been so grateful to the Lord this week that our malls are still standing. I know Port Edward obviously would be the closest to us. That was completely ransacked, completely destroyed, completely looted. Um, and it's amazing how the community there has come together to clean up and do what they, what they have done. Uh, but we're grateful to God that still the big malls in our area still stand. That people still have jobs today. Um, one of the guys who works in our church, uh, who's in our church, went back to work yesterday in Shelley Center. That he still has a job. He's still able to go to work today. And uh, we're grateful, grateful to the Lord for that. That we're still able to, um, that, that yes, we maybe had a little bit of, just a little bit of uncertainty around food and a little bit of uncertainty around petrol for a few days. But the, pet, the, the petrol stations are filling up again. The shopping centers are filling up again. There is food to be bought. And maybe you can't buy your favorite brand of eggs. But, you know, you know a, a, a pastor in Stanger put out a call this week because every single one of their shops are completely finished. Completely finished. They do not have a shop they can go to to get anything. We still have our shops intact. So much to be grateful to God for. And with that, obviously, we need to reach out into our surrounding areas and communities where they don't have. They don't have. They don't have in, in Kwanzi Makwe. They don't have in Baboy. And they don't have in Gamalake. Um, they don't have in, in, some, in some of these spaces. And we need to reach out to them. Amen? But we need to remain thankful. Uh, the spirit of entitlement is a terrible thing. And in, entitlement is the thing that gets killed when we are thankful. Uh, uh, if, if, if you're complaining, <laughs> you're complaining about standing in a shopping line because you can't, to get into the shop, to go, to go shopping. That's entitlement. That went over really well. Might have, <laughs> might have gone over less well online, depending on who's going to be watching later. But, you know, people have been complaining. I have to stand in a line. There was no petrol here. No, no, no. Um, uh, uh, you, you give yourself away on social media, unfortunately. Not you. But <laughs> people give them, themselves away on social media. And you're complaining about standing in a line to get some food. Um, that, that, is in, that is the spirit of entitlement rearing its ugly head. So let's, let's be thankful. Paul said, I've learned, well, this is my next point. I've learned the secret of contentment. I know how to abound and to suffer lack. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's number nine. Learn to be content. Learn to be content. Be content. Be content with what we have, what we don't have. Um, and it's more, this is more real to, especially us in our little South Coast community, because even with what we've seen this week, a lot of us haven't been as affected as people have been affected further afield. So we need to just keep this in mind. Now, I'm not at all in any way downplaying what we have ex been exposed to and, and, and have had to face this week. But we need to remember that whatever it is we are going through, we're not all in the same boat. Okay, learn to be content. Number 10, stay in the word. Stay in the word. It's all too easy to come up with clever ideas and clever strategies and clever little pieces of wisdom. But the word of God is what's got to guide us. The word of God is what's got to lead us. And the more we read scripture, the more it, it works in us. It's like the washing of the word, just washing over us, washing over us, keeping our minds in the right place, keeping our hearts in the right place, reminding us of what it is that God is saying, what it is that he is calling us to. And we keep reading scriptures, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, get into the word, read more than you've ever read before. Um, fill, let's, let's fill ourselves up with the word of God. That's where the fruit is going to come. That's where, the, that's where the, the abundance is going to come. That's where we're going to be able to build up from. We can build and restore our communities from the place of understanding the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So let me run through those, those 10 things again. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling. Ask God for compassion. Walk in forgiveness. Do not allow racism of any form. Help someone. Worship. Pray. Remain thankful. Learn to be content. Stay in the Word. I haven't said anything new. 
It's just we need to be reminded of these things. Paul said to Timothy, remind them of these things. We need to be reminded of these things. Amen? Um, I want to just end um, by reading Nehemiah chapter 4. And I'm going to read it through relatively quickly. But I think it's a, just a great chapter for us just to, just to be aware of um, as we, as we um, go forward. And before we do that, I got this quote off Facebook by, by somebody that I know as well who said this this week. He said, In our struggle and resistance against this attack on South Africa by those who seek to take over and control and divide the people of this country, we must not take the bait of violence or racism. We need to resist, yes, but the goal is peacefully. United, uniting, working together, acts of kindness, generosity, and prayer. This attack will then fail at its very core. At its very core. And we know that there have been things spoken about what could happen this coming week. But we're going to pray that God is going to bring confusion into the enemy camp. Amen? Um, so there's been this thinking that, we, that, we, uh, that Christians sometimes have. It's a bit of an escapist mentality. That one day I'm going to escape out of this world. That Jesus is going to come back and just pull me out of this world. I'm going to escape the chaos and destruction. The problem with that is you've got to really read and be creative with Scripture to even come to that conclusion. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit in the weeks to come. But I want to say the problem with the escapist mentality is that we abdicate our responsibility to disciple nations. So as soon as we say, well, the world's going down and it's going to get worse, well, then I take my hands off and go, it is just what it is. It's the science of the times. That's that. But I can go to scripture after scripture after scripture that talks about rebuilding the ancient ruins, rebuilding cities, building up nations. I can go to scripture that... Uh, well, Matthew 28 that speaks about discipling all nations. I can go to uh, Isaiah chapter 9, I think it is, where it says that of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. That God has put us here on this earth to bring heaven to earth. So many people want to escape and go to heaven when he's called us to bring heaven to earth. Jesus didn't tell us to pray on earth as it is in heaven just to keep us busy praying something while the world falls around to pieces around us until he comes back and snatches us away. Poof! And then all those who don't know him can just kill each other. <laughs> I'm being overdramatic. I hope you, you're okay with the, over, the dramaticism of it all. But if we really think about what it is that, that people sometimes think, is they, they just, they're just waiting for, Jesus is going to rescue me. He's going to rescue me. No, Jesus is not going to rescue you. He already rescued you at the cross. You're here to rescue the world. You're here to rescue the nations. You're here to bring his rescue to the nations. Amen? Okay, I'll start now. Romans chapter 8, verse 19 to 23 says this, and let's just think about this, for the creation, creation, that's this earth, creation, this, what we see around us, waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself, which creation? This creation. The creation itself, this creation, will be set free from its bondage. Amen. Oh, wait, I thought the world was going to get burned up and destroyed and discarded. No, this creation is going to be set free from its bondage. Amen. This cre Heaven is coming to earth. Amen. This creation. Yes. It's a great point, David. <laughs> this creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the same freedom and glory that you and I obtain as the sons and daughters of God. Yeah. This creation. That's why we get out into the streets of Durban and Port Edward and all these other places and we clean up because God has called us as stewards of this creation. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. When Jesus comes back in that day, we will be gloriously transformed into glorious bodies. When he comes back, the world will know it, the world will see it, and he will return to rule and reign on this, in this creation. Amen. More on that in the future, but I wanted to say that to say this. We have a responsibility, and let's not abdicate our responsibility. Nehemiah understood this. So Nehemiah, in, Ephes in Nehemiah chapter 4, it says, so, so the, paint the picture of Nehemiah. He comes into Jerusalem. The walls of Jerusalem are destroyed. And he feels that he needs to build up these walls. And so this is what happens. 
It so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. See, the enemy does not like it when we start to do what God has called us to do. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? We can ask ourselves the questions, what are these feeble Christians doing? Oh, these feeble Christians, what do they think they're doing? Walking around, you know, did you see the guy blowing his bagpipes in Durban? I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but I mean, Christians do some weird things. What are these weird feeble Christians doing? Um, Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Can a nation be built in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that have been burned. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. In South African context, if one of these street dogs steps on your wall, it will fall over. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. And that is what we're praying, not for people, but for the, the, the evil forces of wickedness who are operating through people. Amen? Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall. So there's provocation. There's slander. There's these things being spoken. Oh, you feeble people. What if, even if a, a dog steps up onto what you've been building, it's going to fall over. So we built the wall. We pray, we turn our faces to God, and then we carry on building. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And if ever there was a time to work, now is the time. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites, that's a lot of people, heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and that the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. The enemy is not liking and will not like what it is that we will be doing and what it is that we are building as a church in this nation. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. If this week was something, it was something of conspiring together to attack to create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Now remember, our watch is not against people. We guard in the physical, but our watch is against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. We guard against those who want to physically come in and destroy. Absolutely. But we do it with respect, we do it with love, and we do it without racism. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. Sounds familiar, right? And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us 10 times. In other words, just in case you guys are not listening, let me just tell you again, disaster's coming. I always tell you again, disaster's coming. Have you not seen what they've been saying on Facebook? Have you not seen what's been put on, 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 on WhatsApp? Disaster's coming. 10 times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon you. Therefore, Nehemiah positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings. And I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And God is positioning every single one of us in strategic places in the spirit. Strategic places so that we can prevent the attack of the enemy in our region. Amen? Therefore, I positioned people with their swords, their spears, their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. We touched on that just now. We're fighting for the generations to come. We're fighting for the generations to come. We're not backing down. We're not going to hide away. We're not going to be pushed into a corner of irrelevance. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plan to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on, that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. We're not going to let our guard down. We're, that's why I said we, what, if we've been praying more this week, we must pray even more. Whatever it is that God has called us into, let's not back down. Let's just, let's, let's just allow this, this little ripple or this little wave to become a tidal wave. A, a tidal wave, amen? Um, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore the armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah, those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, with the other hand held a weapon. So we're going to be building, we're going to be praying. We're going to be building, and we're going to be fighting in the Spirit. We're going to be building, we're going to be making a difference, we're going to be feeding the poor, we're going to be preaching the gospel, and we're going to be praying. We're going to be holding the line in the Spirit. Amen? Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. 
and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So we, we're going out into battle, and we're going to listen to the sound of the trumpet. We're not going to be reacting to the voices of fear. We're not going to be reacting to what the enemy may be saying. We're going to be listening for the sound of the trumpet. The sound of the trumpet was beside me. Then I stood. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. We're going to listen to his voice, what he is saying, to the Holy Spirit's voice, to the sound of the trumpet. And we're going to rally together where, where we need to rally together so that we can fill the gaps so that the wall can be built. So we labored in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our God by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the God who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. I'm really glad that he clarified that. <laughs> it goes on to say, the wall was built. The wall was built. Then they, they started dealing with other issues of administration that were needed um, as a result of, you know, this, the, the city of Jerusalem starting to be populated. We're going to win this battle. We're going to win this fight. And uh, so I want to encourage us with that. I hope you're encouraged.